Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask you to turn to the book of Psalms, uh, or the 40th Psalms, Psalms 40, and while you're turning there, we would always desire your prayers that the Lord uh, would bless, and that uh, I would follow His will and not man's will. Uh, Psalms 40, in the very first verse. Psalms 40, in the first verse, the Bible says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my foot upon a rock and established and established my goings. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for an opportunity to be in your house this morning, Lord. We Praise you for an opportunity to look one, one more time into your word this side of eternity. God, we pray this morning that you would come down and that you would bless. Lord, every person in here, they would uh, hear the call, Lord, to uh, be renewed in thy strength or be saved, Lord. We know that you can draw men unto yourselves. We pray that you would do that, Lord. Uh, give, us, uh, give us encouragement along the way, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now, we're going to look at a number uh, of thoughts out of these verses, fairly familiar verses of Scripture, but uh, the testimony of David when things get bad. The testimony of David about his own salvation, I believe, and what he was relying on when the times got tough. And he begins, I waited patiently for the Lord. Yes. Now, if, you, uh, if you're any a little bit like me, patience is not your strongest suit. And that's what I've seen, sadly enough, in many of believers' hearts today. We just don't have the strength to wait on the Lord. The Bible says, wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. And in, in waiting for the Lord, things get discouraging. Uh, in an instant world where we can have anything we want to in just a matter of minutes, waiting is not popular. Right. Waiting is not something that we, that we excel in. And, and so many times while we're waiting, what seems like a lifetime has only been a year or two. Mm -hmm. And we're still, oh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do now? Well, the only, friend, uh, the only thing I can say to you, dear friend, is to keep waiting, to keep being patient in the Lord. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me. Now, I want you to see that he makes a break here. Inclined and hearing is two different things, two different events, two different happenings. When you incline to someone, you kind of turn toward them. If they're speaking to you, you begin to give them attention. Now, all of you know my hearing is not the best, and sometimes you have to repeat my name more than once. And when I hear Larry, eventually I'll turn to you. I'll incline my ears. I, I'm on focus now. And not that the Lord can't do that anytime, certainly can, but sometimes he doesn't incline to give us patience. He doesn't turn your way to teach you something. He, he doesn't immediately run just because you said so. And it's always for our benefit and for our help because listen, you got to wait on some things. You know, uh, I certainly hope the Lord will split the eastern sky today and he'll, and he'll round up all his elect from this earth and we'll be on home with him forevermore. But here's the fact of the matter. We don't know that. And so the best thing that I could give you is patience. The uh, Bible says patient is, patience is a virtue. Uh, it also says this, that, that uh, it is one of the fruits of the Spirit. And, and so a lot of times the reason we lack it is because we do not have, uh, we, we don't have the, the, the patience enough to let that fruit grow. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined into me and heard my cry. Now, uh, I believe if, if I understand that teaching right, it's not like the boo-hoo cry. It's like, hello, 
that's a cry. And, and, and he wasn't boo-hooing about it. He was crying out to the Lord. Now, I personally believe the first time that David said, Lord, help me, he didn't hear him. Well, he heard him, but he didn't respond. Lord, help me. You know, when, when you're trying to get somebody's attention, you begin, you get it one volume, and then you pick it up and pick it up, and you may be doing this and trying to get their attention. You know what? When, when we incline ourselves into the Lord, that's what we need to do. We, we need to just uh, uh, give it all we have and, and, and try to and, and, uh, be in a situation where we're engaged with the Lord and He with us. That takes a patience to, uh, to do that. Uh, verse 2, David says, He brought me up also out of a horrible pit. Mm -hmm. Now, lost people, I want you to hear this this morning. Take it home with you. You're in a horrible, horrible pit. And you don't even know it yourself. That's a revealed truth. A horrible pit. Now, you know, this is the thing with a pit like he's talking. The more you scramble, the deeper you get. And, and the more the more you go down, the worse it gets. And it, it eventually takes you under. See, sin will consume you. And, and I'll even go this far. Even the saved individual, sin can consume your testimony. And listen, the... The devil likes nothing better for that to happen. Right. Uh, that was his real object with Job, was it not? That was his goal, was to bring Job's testimony down to nothing. And, and we see that that did not happen because even at the worst point, he still gave God great glory and great honor and would not blaspheme his name even when his wife said, curse God and die. And he was still serving the Lord. And so we find this miry pit is sin, and this miry pit is something that you have to have deliverance from. You have to have uh, the Lord Jesus come along and raise you up out of that pit because there's no way out upon your own. There's no way, no remedy, no nothing you can do without that. And he brought me also. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. Now, another thing, and, and there's some clay dirt in Stewart County, and uh, it usually is up on top of a ridge. Clay dirt is different than in, 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 the, uh, in, in the hollows of Stewart County. You'll find, you'll find mostly very fertile soil, just black, uh, good soil. But on the ridge top, you know, uh, out going toward Clark, there's a whole place out there, a community called Ridge Top, or Red Top, excuse me. And the reason the ground is red and it's miry, and, and it is good for growing some things, it's great for growing corn, but it's very, very sticky. You ever been in red clay? Uh, I have, and, uh, and, and you just can't get it off your shoes. You, you can't remove it, no way. And it's just as sticky as glue. And if you wear a pair of shoes and wet red miry clay, you just as well as to throw them away because you ain't gonna get them back. And, and the sin is the very same way. Red miry clay will stick to you and you just can't get it off. You, you can't do that on your own. And that is the, the position of a sinner. They've got red miry clay and they can't get it off. There, there's nothing to be done. But without the intervention of the Almighty, you'll stay in that condition the entirety of your life. That is the situation, the red miry clay. Out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Now, I want you to see that David didn't crawl up on the rock. God brought him up out of it and set, it, and set him where he needed to be. You know where you need to be this morning? You need to be on the rock. Uh, remember what the Lord said concerning the church? On, on this rock, I will build my church. And another time he says <laughs> that we're to build our house on the rock. Remember the, the wise man that built his house upon the rock and the foolish man that built his house right. upon the sand? You know what that's really about, losing your family? It, it's not just establishing yourself. Who lives in my house? Me and my girls and Joey, right? 
uh, man, you need to build your house on solid rock because the storm's coming. That they're just as much part of life as, as the good part of life. And so we find then that as, uh, as David is given his testimony, he give God the praise and the glory for it. He put him where he was. Now, I will ask you this this morning. I bet he, when he was in the pit, it was hard to be patient. Man, when you're going down, it's hard to be patient, isn't it? it it's hard to trust when you see no way out. Verse 4, blessed is the man, uh, I'm sorry, verse 3, and he have put a new song in my mouth. You know what? When the, when the Lord saves you, you will you all you want to do is utter his praise. When you really got something real from God, you think about the time when the Lord first saved you, all you want to do is praise him. All you want to to do is give him glory and honor because he put something new within you. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. When he gets that into your life, you'll never get over it. And, and you know, that's a good barometer this morning. That's a good measurement this morning. Are you really saved? What, what's your favorite thing to talk about? What thrills your soul more than anything else to speak of the name of Jesus? And so we find then, as the Lord's people, that's where we ought to be, and that's where God had placed David in a position where he, he wanted to praise him more than he wanted anything else. And he put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto God, many shall see it and fear. Now, uh, you know, when uh, I don't know exactly when the Lord saved David, I personally believe he was saved sometime before he was anointed. Uh, I don't believe um, that the Lord God would have let, led his men to anoint a lost man to the person of kingship. And, and, and so, but you know, he spent a lot of time alone, didn't he? As a shepherd boy. He, he was the one that was responsible for keeping the flock in tow and to protect them, and that's where he killed a lion and killed a bear. But you know, I bet every day he wasn't killing a lion and killing a bear, was it? He only spoke of that two times that he, he had done a bear and a lion. You know what, I bet the most of the time was pretty boring, don't you? You ever had a job that was just so boring you could scream? Now I've had a few, not many, but a few. Usually I'm running myself to death. But because of COVID, my job has been pretty slow for the last eight months. And you know what I found? It just gives me time to think. You know why people don't like being alone? They have to think. They have to understand. You know, invariably when you're alone, you always want to turn something on. Uh, I know even when we're not at home and uh, used to, when nothing else is going on, Donna's in the house, Joey's in the house, and he, don't, he, he ain't exactly someone to have a conversation with, and she'll turn on the TV so it, she says it helps her concentrate to cook. Now, for me, I'm a one-minded person. It distracts me. But we like to hear something all the time, don't we? And you know why we don't like to dwell on the cell? See, when you don't have TV and you don't have a cell phone and, and you're not driving in the car somewhere, the only thing left is to think. And we dwell on things. And, and so I believe the best thing that happened to David was that years where he had to contemplate something, and I believe he contemplated on the Lord God and he contemplated on himself and his need, and somehow by his marvelous grace, he, he was sent that way, and the Lord God saved him. And so uh, he, he said after this experience, he was able uh, to give the Lord the praise he deserved. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust. Now, lost people again, where are you putting your trust at this morning? Um, I put my trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm assured, I'm assured about that. See, uh, you place your trust in Jesus, 
the Holy Ghost comes by and encourages you in that. Do I understand the miraculous thing of being saved? No, I don't. And if I live a hundred years, I don't know that I'd ever fully understand the work of salvation completely. But I do know this, and I've experienced this time and time again when the Holy Ghost comes by and whispers in my ear, it's well. I, I've got this. Everything, you know what? When you forget everything else, you remember that the water of the Red Sea as it splashed about was under Jesus' feet. Man. He He's above it all. And he needs, uh, he does not need your assistance to, uh, to take control of the situation. He's got it already. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Then he, he gives them two warnings in verse 4. The first one, don't respect the proud. In other words, when somebody comes in, you don't owe them any obeisance at all. Your obeisance belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Belongs to the Lord, the mighty God of all heaven. And, and he says, be careful how you look at these people. Uh, uh, probably the most obvious example is the Pope. If he came in here, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be rude to him. I wouldn't treat anything in him any different than anybody else. Probably ask him, well, what are you doing here? Right? But we, we tend to do that. It's just give them that obeisance. You know what? They don't deserve it. Uh, and and, and it's, no need, it's no problem being respectful, but see, the, uh, David had his respect in the right person, and that was the person of the Lord uh, God Almighty. Uh, uh, nor such as turn aside to lies. Now, he says, you don't respect them either. And notice it says, it's not the ones that try to turn him aside to lies. It's the ones that turn aside to lies. Uh, we don't have to respect them. You know, uh, in the modern day, in the church age, he says, what you need to do is set him out among from the assembly. Uh, you know what? Uh, don't grieve over it. Don't, don't get upset. You know, uh, uh, people that love the Lord and people that has genuinely be, been saved, I fully believe they still stick with the Lord's church. Even when it's down to two or three gathered in my name, they'll stick with the church. And when they don't, they won't. Uh, well, and so we find then that it's not a disrespectful thing, but it's placing your respect in the right person, in the right place, in the right person, and that of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't follow someone and run after a person. It will always mess you up. Verse 5, Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done. You know, what a wonderful, glorious thing. Many, uh, all the works that he has done in our lives, every little thing you look out uh, across the uh, Stewart County right now, the most beautiful trees. I was looking out my front door the other day, and one as you start down the driveway, the most beautiful yellow that I've ever seen. There's one outside uh, one of the windows there at the nursing home, just the most bright red I've ever seen in my life. You know what? That ain't just the seasons passing by. He did that. Plus give you something good to eat. Plus give you a warm place to stay. Plus, uh, you know, on and on and on we could go. He did it everything for us. And <laughs> what, 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 what blows my mind, while he's doing it, for me, he's doing it for you and for you and for you all the time. What a mighty, mighty God we serve. And you know what? I believe David was so caught up in that that it truly amazed him. You know what? When we say amazing grace, I really don't know how amazed we really are. Do you? Sometimes we get so used to seeing that mm, that we forget how amazing our God is. Spoke this place into being. And, and not for us. The, 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 a lot of people would like you to, you know why he spoke this place into being? For his own glory and for his own honor. You know why he saves people? It's not to keep you out of hell. He saves people for his own glory and his own honor. Everything, you know why it's so beautiful right now? 
why he's painted the trees such a beautiful color for his own glory and for his own honor. That, that, that's what David understood and knew that, that God was doing amazing things all around him all the time. And many, O Lord, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done and thy thoughts which are to us. Now, yeah, I, I mean, that blows my mind when I began to think the thoughts God has unto me. Now, a trembling thought is that he knows my thoughts and knows my ways. But this one says he's thinking about you. And can you imagine on a day when he says, you know what? This is what I'm going to do for Larry today. This is what I'm going to do for Donna. This is what I'm going to do to for New Testament Baptist Church. This is my plan for them today. And in an instance, it takes place. Uh, that, that's beyond my comprehension. Every breath that I take is a gift from God. Have you ever thought about that? Most people have experienced. I had two patients like this for a long time in home health. They were both on ventilators. A ventilator is a machine that inflates your lungs for you because you can't do it yourself. And I sat there and I watched those men, it was both, both males, one of them was much older than me. And I watched that machine cycle and their chest would go and then down again. And if that machine went off, the next one wouldn't come. But yet, still, I walk around, I breathe, my heart beats, and I never even give it a second thought. I'm so used to it. But you know what it is? It's a blessing of the Almighty. In an instant, it can take that from us. Now, and I guarantee you, then you would appreciate it. Then you'd see what a what glorious blessing it is. So on and on and on we could go. Uh, just like, uh, you know, it boggles my mind and when you when you begin to think of it, you really could never stop to end his praises if you begin to think again and again and again and again what he's done for you, you could never ever be done. Have all the time that there is and still be praising him again and again and again. Many, O oh Lord, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done. Thy thoughts, which are to us, Lord, they cannot be reckoned up. In other words, they can't be numbered. They can't be, they can't be described in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak them, there are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering didst thou not, des didst thou not desire. Now, Sacrifice is fine, and that was the uh, method, I guess, without a better word, of the Old Testament. But you know what? He wasn't interested in that. The Bible says he owns a cattle of a thousand hills. Why does he need a bullet to come before the altar? Well, what it was is they wanted, he wanted them to know who he was. He wanted to get them to give something of himself. But listen, everything is his anyway. Why could we not praise that? Why could we not give him uh, great glory and honor when you literally look out and every blade of grass was brought, was brought forth by the mighty God of heaven? That, that's unfathomable. That I can't get a hold of that, and yet it's, it's still he's the very God I serve. It's amazing. It, it, it's un, it, it, it just unbelievable what our God does and how that he accomplishes it for his own glory and for his own uh, honor. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears has thou opened. My ears has thou opened. And, and you know what? When you're a little hard of hearing, you begin to appreciate these two things than you do when you, when you, you can hear a pin drop. But you know what? What did he say to the churches uh, of Asia? He that had an ear, let him hear. And David said, man, I was glad when I began to hear. You know what? Because prior to this, he didn't have a spiritual ear. And we look at all things and uh, my cousin trying to console me the other night, uh, last night, and you know why? She's a sweet lady, but you know why Joyce don't know it? She don't have ears. 
And you know what? Probably one of the greatest miracles there is that he woke up this, that I could understand my own nature in his realm. And see, when you understand that, you will cry out to him because you have nothing left to do. He, he opened up my ears so I could hear him. And that, that, that's glorious blessing in and of itself that, that, that he would look on a man the way that he did and wake up his ears so that he might hear spiritual things. And without that, they, there, there is no hope whatsoever. Uh, as a result of this, verse 7, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. On every page, on every line, all through this glorious book. You know, some people say the genealogies in the back of this book sometimes get a little boring. And I've read them all. Not to brag, but I've read this book cover to cover. And you know what? It gets a little dry in there. But you know what? Somewhere, and I'm missing it because it hasn't been open to me yet, but somewhere in that thing, it's speaking of Christ. I just need to look at it. See, the volume of the book speaks of me. Every page, every line tells the story of Christ. Uh, you know, one time Brother McCoy said, Brother Larry, I see election and predestination on every line. And you know what? I bet he did. <laughs> That's the kind of man that he was. But you know what we need to see every line on this morning? is Christ. He's sufficient for sin. Everything from in the beginning to even come so Lord Jesus. Everything in between, we need to understand and know, and, and know whom Christ is. And so we find then that David understood this, and, and years and years before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, he understood this to a great deal, very much more than many, uh, many do today. Verse 8, I delight to do thy will. Now, this morning, you think about this. Because it's a barometer. It measures your salvation. Do you delight to do the will of God? Does it thrill your soul? Does it, does it make your heart thump and be glad again? Just, just excited. Now, if you'll be honest with me this morning, that ain't always the case, is it? But when you're in the will of the Lord, you know what the will of the Lord could be for you? <laughs> As simple as knocking on the door. But you know what the will of the Lord might be for you? To go hungry for three or four days. No, if he wouldn't do that just to his children, well, you better read the Bible. See, it's good when the times are good, ain't it? But yeah. we simply, but, but when you find the will of the Lord, say, you know what, Larry? I want you to walk and spread the gospel all along 79. You know what? Uh, I know immediately I go, well, you know what? I don't think my knees could do that. Listen, they're nearly bone to bone. I don't think I could do that. Again, we come up with something and my ankle hurts and this and that. But can we get to a point we'd be excited, be glad, be thrilled that he would do that, that he'd use us in such a way. And certainly that's what uh, David was, was understanding, was that he needed to be excited to do the will of God. Now, if you will remember in, in David's end times, as things was moving on because he was a man of war and a man of blood, he could not build the temple. And you know what? He wanted to. He wanted to bad. But somewhere along the way, he knew it was his will not to. And, and you know what? He became okay with that. When do you become okay with the will of God? When you get that stinking flesh under control. And then you're okay with it, whatever it may be. Well, whatever he, uh, whatever he may find for you. And so David says, listen, I delight in this thing. I delight being in the will of the Lord. I delight being in the will of the Lord more than doing it, doing what I want to do. I have preached righteousness 
in the great congregation. How many messages have you heard on righteousness lately? Holy living, coming out from this stinking, ungodly world and living a life that would be pleasing to, pleasing to the Lord. You know what? In the late 60s up to the mid-70s, listen, if you went to an independent Baptist church, like it or not, that's what you were going to hear. Where has that gone? Well, I'll tell you where it's gone. People have compromised to the right. point there's nothing left. Right. Now. Look like, act like, seem like the world, right? And, and you know what? If you're okay with that, something is spiritually wrong. We ought to be like David. We ought to be like, and you know, preach it whether they like it or not, if they leave it or not, and, and keep preaching it. And that's exactly, he says, listen, uh, <laughs> I preach righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips. Oh, Lord, thou knowest. You know what? Uh, when you refrain your lips, you, you're afraid you don't feel somebody, ain't you? Well, I better not say that. <laughs> why not? I mean, really, if the Lord God's in it, why not say, you know what? Women don't need to be running around in breeches or skirts up to here and, and, and looking just like the world. Men don't need to be running around with their hump, uh, hair down to their shoulders and listening to worldly, ungodly music. It ought not to be. Why not just say it? Don't refrain your lips. Uh, how often have you, have you wanted to say it but you didn't? Hey, man, that's wrong. That is wrong. But why do we reframe our lips? I think why we're scared. We're scared. We don't want to be eyeballed. We don't want to be uh, looked at. We don't want to be uh, angry. Somebody to be angry with us. That's why we're not. And so David had give a great testimony to his congregation. Now notice the uh, uh, end of that. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. So preach love. Should you preach the stuff I just said? Sure. But you know what we need to preach? The love of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came and gave himself for the sins of his people. What could be more loving than that? What, what, what? Until you spill out yourself on behalf of someone else, you cannot understand that. Verse 11, withhold not thy tender mercies from me. Now, we see almost a turn in things, and maybe David is feeling a little threatened. Maybe David's a little upset, and you know what? You're going to be upset along this Christian way. Listen, it's not going to always be health and wealth, and I, I've heard that for years, but listen, the Bible says, and in, in the midst of this great phrase, he begins to express a little fear. What about you? You know what I found among men, particularly, they don't want to express their fears. Uh, and I really don't understand that, but it does, it does follow the man gender more than it does the women. But we just, you know what I think it, what we think it means is that we're inadequate. If we can't take care of the problem, something needs to be wrong. And so, but David, probably the greatest warrior that ever lived, he says, listen, I'm a little scared. Withhold not thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. You know what? If you don't know any other verse for eternal security, you look at that, and he says, your loving mercy preserves me forever. So when we say, hey, it is not, a, he's not able, you got to hang in there yourself. What you're doing, really doing, is not denying the power of the Almighty. You're just saying he's not able to do it. He can't complete the task. He's not able. And you know what? The Bible says of things like that, uh, <laughs> that you're, two more, you're twofold more the child of hell. And so David trusted him unbelievably. For innumerable, uh, innumerable evils has compassed me about. Now there's two, two words that there that uh, means kind of like a circle. 
He says they've compassed me about in a circle. Compass may be surrounding and about may be surrounding as well. Now, if I was going this way and I saw a rattlesnake, what would be my natural inclination? Right? And I turn around that way and I see a copperhead. See, he was in a situation he couldn't handle on himself. You know what, dear lost friend, you're in a situation you can't handle yourself. The snakes are after you. They're going to they're gonna come and, and David had got that point to that point of problems. And you know what? You will too. Difficulty will come. But great, but you know what? The Bible says this, his grace is sufficient. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to get bit sometime. You know what? Every one of us <laughs> could say that if we would. But what we really need to focus on is how good he's been. And he delivers us time and time again because of his namesake. I am not able to look up. <coughs> what do you suppose that means? I, I'm not able. You know what? Because the real thing in prayer is this, and, and, and we're taught, and it's kind of Catholicism, but we're taught to pray like this, right? You know, this is where we should be. Almighty oh, God, preserve me. Keep me in thy will. Walk with me all the days of my life. But David had gotten such a condition, he was down like this. Back to the point quick. You ever been there? And you know what? The best advice I can give to you, and everybody says, well, just pray in that situation where they got it partly right. Pray in that situation. Don't just pray, oh, Lord, deliver me. Get me out of this. No, uh, I know that thou art still God. I know that you're on your throne. I know you speaketh well of all things. I don't understand this situation, but I certainly know that you do. See, that's a whole different attitude, is it not? Maybe the devil likes to get us down when we're looking, we're looking down more than we're looking up. But listen, what does the Bible say concerning end time studies? Look up, lift up your head. Redemption draws nigh. Don't you look at your feet. You look at the Almighty. He'll bless you. I'm almost done, I promise. Verse 15. Let them be desolate for a reward of their shame that say unto me, Aha! Aha! You know, uh, I think a lot about Sister Millie and I've been trying to pay, pray for her. And you know what? I bet the devil's aha uh in -huh her a whole lot right now, don't you? Millie, it's back. Aha! Uh -huh. I told you he couldn't do it. Now it's in the second spot. Aha! Uh aha! -huh. Uh -huh. I told you he was insufficient. He does that all the time to the people that love him, does he not? You know, he did it to Job. Aha! Uh aha! -huh, uh -huh. You know what? Put him on the run with some prayer. You know, you know what Jesus did when he was attacked and from Satan? He quoted in scripture. Now you can't quote it if you don't know it, right? Aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. And, and, and that's, that's the devil's thing, is he wants to discourage you to the point of quitting, and then he wants you to quit. Verse 16. Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in there, in that spot. When he's behind you, you give him great glory. In that very situation, you lift up his name and you praise his name and you give great glory to his name because you know what? He's still on the throne and it's all under his feet and running right by him. That's the God of the Bible. It's not the God of this world. But it is the God of the Bible. And so what we need to do is just continue to praise Him. And when the aha comes along, you go right on down to verse, <laughs> the next verse, if you're really seeking Him. Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Listen. Uh, you lost people, keep seeking. You know, uh, we need to teach that to our children. I understand the doctrines of election. I know whole, the whole 
doctrines of grace, I understand that. But seek you, Lord, while he may be found. You look unto him. He's still a savior. He's still a friend. And he saves, as the Bible said, whomsoever will. Now, do I know that? No. Does God know that? Yes. So what I can give advice to you, lost person, is seek him. Seek him with everything that you've got. Whatever possesses you, you use it to seek the Lord. Let all those that seek rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. Oh, you get a, you get a hold of that this morning? Do you just love your salvation? <clears throat> Boy, I do, because you know what? It's far more than I could ever ask or think. I love my salvation. You know what? I have a lot of blessings in my life. I've had a lot of things. God's been so good to me, but more than anything, I, I, got, I bought me a new truck this year. Well, I knew to me. That's good, ain't it? Listen, that ain't a thimble worth of nothing compared to my great salvation. Been healed more than once in my life. Praise be unto God. But listen, that ain't nothing compared to I will never face a devil's hell. I will never face an eternity ever, ever again. The devil going, aha, I told you. But you know what? He's off the scene. What a wonderful, wonderful, great salvation that we have in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you really know him? Do you really know him? That's the only thing you can answer. And only you can answer that, brother.